Welcome, everybody. To our very, you can tell this is the first time that LFJA has done a big uh, call like this, and we're so glad you're here. Absolutely, and um, welcome to Reimagining Family Justice, an event put on by Louisville uh, Family Justice Advocates, the ACLU of Kentucky, and the Bell Project. And we're very, very fortunate to have Sylvia A. Harvey here with us tonight and some other special guests. Uh, Sylvia A. Harvey is the author of um, a, a new book which centers a whole lot around uh, the state of Kentucky and mass incarceration and its effects on um, family systems. Her book is called The Shadow System, Mass Incarceration and American Families. Um, and Sylvia um, will tell us a little more about that later. So first I wanted to introduce some of the folks that um, we'll be talking about mass incarceration and um, issues pertaining to families here with us tonight. First off, my name is Amanda Hall. I am the um, policy strategist, the smart justice policy strategist at the ACLU of Kentucky. That's a brand new job change, so y'all be gracious with me here. And um, I'm also formerly incarcerated. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a person that suffered from substance use disorder, um, from severe trauma, um, and you'll hear this correlation in this story a few times tonight, um, because unfortunately in the state of Kentucky so often are women that enter the justice system. Um, we have a lot of those things in common. Um, so next I will introduce again the amazing and talented Sylvia A. Harvey. Um, a little background on Sylvia. She is an award-winning journalist and the author of The Shadow System, Mass Incarceration and the American Family. She reports at the intersection of race, class, incarceration, and policy. Her work has appeared in Elle, The Nation, Vox, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Appeal, and more. She is a recipient of a National Headliner Award and a National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award. The Oakland native holds a BA in Sociology from Columbia University and an MS in Journalism from Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. And Harvey lives in New York City. And Sylvia, if you just wanna do a little wave, so folks, <laughs> Sylvia. Okay. Next up, we have Kentucky, one of Kentucky's finest, and Representative Attica Scott. Um, Representative Scott began serving Kentucky House District 41 in January of 2017. She currently serves on the Education, Elections Constitutional Amendments, and Intergovernmental Affairs, and Veterans, Military Affairs, and Public Protection Committees as well as the Budget Review Subcommittee on Primary and Secondary Education and Workforce Development. Her proudest accomplishment is being a mom to advocate and being a mom to advocate um, Ashanti, who's her beautiful daughter. And um, you can follow her on Instagram and Twitter. It's always a good time, y'all. You'll learn so much at Attica Scott 4 ky and Representative Scott, if you want to give a wave, I know we all know who you are. Uh, thank you. Okay, next up we have um, Miss LaTanya McNeil. Um, LaTanya is a person in long-term recovery. She was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, but she currently resides here in Louisville, Kentucky. She's passionate about recovery and helping whenever she can at whatever capacity to assist in the fight against unjust laws and to advocate to lawmakers and politicians. Mm -hmm. She is a smart justice advocate at the ACLU of Kentucky. She is an emerging leader and she works in Louisville in the recovery field. She also works as a detox and overnight um, supervisor here in Louisville to women who are experiencing homelessness. So LaTanya, if you wanna give a little way. There's Miss LaTanya. Okay, next up we have Christina Walker, um, better known as Chrissy. She has been directly impacted by the criminal, just, the criminal legal system. 
Chrissy has also um, suffered from a substance use disorder and has known all too well the impact of incarceration as a parent and has dealt with the child welfare system, also known as Kentucky as VCBS. Chrissy states in her own words that the system has gravely affected her life and her family. Her family has been shattered like a million pieces on the floor, Chrissy said, and we'll get to hear a little bit more about her later. Chrissy, if you wanna give away, Hey. Hey. Thank you, Chrissy. And then uh, the, the phenomenal Judy Jennings. Judy Jennings is the director of the special project, which creates art activities with families in the visitor's lobby of the Louisville Jail when video visiting is allowed. She is also the coordinator of Louisville Family Justice Advocates, a 5013C3 organization that works to build knowledge create art, and change policies that support families with incarcerated loved ones in the Louisville jail. Judy is also the person that asked the individual with the thickest accent to narrate tonight's proceedings. So y'all just know that that's why I'm talking so much. But um, Judy, if you want to tell us a little bit more about Louisville Family Justice Advocates and kick us off, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, Amanda. You know, uh, we're um, Eastern Kentucky. Uh, we have some roots there that <laughs> we share. Uh, it's such an honor to be in this virtual space. I mean, this is pretty amazing. It's LFJA is a new organization and you all showed up with all these wonderful women on the panel and all of you who are here. Um, if, if you all didn't know, in 2008, I was the head of the arts organization here and one day a woman walked into my office and she told me about what her experience was in the visitor's lobby of the jail the night before. She had her two grandchildren and she took them down there to have a video visit with their father, who was her son. And they waited over two hours and it's in the basement of the Hall of Justice and there was no activities for the children. And she pointed her finger at me and she said, you need to make art activities in the visitor's lobby. And she was right. Um, we did, so we got a team and we put it together and that became the special project. And every weekend since 2008, every weekend since 2008, that's a lot of years, we have done art activities in the visitor's lobby of the Louisville Jail until the middle of March when visiting uh, is closed by COVID-19. So uh, that's a lot of uh, nights that we sat, uh, our team was there with the families. And we saw a lot of changes uh, since 2008. Uh, the team, the racial disparities just grew and grew in the visitor's lobby as we sat there week after week. And we knew it was because uh, there was raci racially disparate mass incarceration in our city. It was showing, those were the people that were coming to the visitor's lobby. And Sunday night visits at the jail are only for male visitors. And those, those people visiting kept getting younger and younger because the people being incarcerated were younger and younger. And so they would be young mothers with young children, visiting young fathers, young black fathers who had been arrested because of mass incarceration and could not pay their fines and bails in most cases. So we saw a lot of changes from 2008 to, last, to, to now. But one thing that didn't change is that those families still wait two hours or more, and they still only have a 20 minute video visitation when the jail is open for visits. And I know they can't be open for COVID, during COVID, but there hasn't been, as far as I know, there hasn't been very much communication with the families about when they will be able to come back. And as far as I know, there haven't been any free visit, free phone calls offered to the families. So we decided, uh, uh, because of these differences, we decided we were gonna try out policy change because we wanted to see changes. And that's how Let Louisville Family Justice Advocates got uh, started. And it's only been a, 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 a 501c3 for, six, for less than six months. But we really believe that policy change can start on the local level. And I think that the no-knock uh, is a beautiful example of a, a important, important policy change that started here in Louisville. And more important than that even is that LFJA follows the lead of Just Leadership USA 
and uh, all of us are none uh, in having incarcerated people who have a direct experience with incarceration centering their voices because we can't make policy changes if we don't know who about the experts and how it feels to be incarcerated, what it takes to make the, if the criminal legal system change. So we wanted to uh, start out, have our big national debut with, with people who have had direct experience and also with the advocates and art activists that are working to change the policies. So that's what brought us all together. And as one of my uh, friends said, a new day is coming. A new day is coming, y'all. And we see it here in Louisville and it's gonna be us joining us activists and advocates and, and people directly impacted together making that change. And thank you for being part of it tonight. Thank you so, so much, Judy. And also for folks um, to be able to focus on speaker, if you can change your view on Zoom to speaker view instead of gallery, you'll really be able to um, pinpoint who's speaking at that time. Just a little, someone very great just gave me that little comment in the um, chat box. So, okay. So next up, we are going to um, go to the amazing Sylvia A. Harvey. Um, I look forward so much to hearing about her new book, which, spoiler alert, it's amazing. I have a copy and I've read it. I may or may not be in it under a different name. But anyway, uh, now y'all have to read it so you can guess. Um, but Sylvia, if you would just kick us off, we would... Love to know more about your book, Why Kentucky, and uh, a little bit about you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, hello, Kentucky. <laughs> uh, I am here in New York. Um, you guys can find me on social media as Miss Sa. That's M S underscore S A H. And I go by Sa because that's easier and that means people won't forget my middle initial. Um, I've been reporting uh, at the intersection of race, class, policy, and incarceration for about the last four years, um, really focusing on long form investigative pieces, uh, using narrative, really focusing on telling the stories um, of people that are impacted and then backing into the policy, making sure that people understand what's happening by using these stories to illustrate that. Um, and the book is, here, in case you guys want to see what it looks like. Um, why did I write this book? That's always a question. It's always, every time I feel like I have to think about it again, right, because there's so many reasons. Um, mass incarceration has quadrupled since 1980, um, and, and that is a huge, huge jump. So something that has has made me think about why, right? We have 2.3 million people that are incarcerated. We have 2.7 million children um, that have a parent that is incarcerated. We've got over 555,000 people that are being held um, in our um, country's jails because they're waiting trial, right? So if you're awaiting trial, that means you haven't been found guilty. And a lot of people just can't afford to bail out. So what does it mean to have over 550,000 people that are behind bars because they don't have the money to get out of jail, right? So what does it mean uh, to not have something, to not have $300, right? In some cases, it's $300, $200. And for some people, they're like, oh, that's not a lot of money. But we have to look at that as a lot of money for many people. And that's something that really made me think about why so many people are confined um, and how we're perpetuating uh, this, this idea of mass incarceration and poverty by keeping these people behind bars. Um, so really just looking at what that means and thinking about the numbers, right? We've got over 6.7 million people that are under some kind of um, correctional control. So that's a huge, huge um, chunk of our society. And it's not just the people, right, that are incarcerated. What I wanted to focus on or pay some attention to is what's happening to the family, right? When someone's incarcerated, there's the assumption that, oh, their life simply disappears. But it doesn't, because if you're a mother, you remain a mother. If you're a father, you remain a father. If you, you know, are a son, you remain a son. So what does that mean? What does that look like? And so in the shadow system, I really just looked at the impact incarceration has on the entire family and also looked at 
a number of social institutions, some of our most important institutions and how they impact these people that are already um, dealing with one aspect of our, our system. So if you are already dealing with a criminal justice system, what does it mean for uh, you to also have to deal with our education system, right? The child welfare system, all these systems that um, are not doing right by people that are um, involved in our criminal legal system. So I've highlighted that in the book, right? So in a number of different states, I've gone to three states, and I'll just briefly tell you about the state so that I can get to the state that you guys probably care about the most, which is Kentucky. Um, but for me, going to um, Miami meant looking at a young man, in this case, a young black man at 20 years old being sentenced to the life a life without the possibility of parole sentence for a conviction of murder. And for many people, it's like, wow, a person was convicted of murder. Perhaps you believe that um, the sentence was, was warranted. But for me, I always question that. How is it that you sentence someone to life without the possibility of parole? Where is uh, this idea of rehabilitation and redemption? But not only that, I want to know how he got to that point. So for me, that means going back and looking at the structural sort of inequality that exists in this country. It's embedded in this nation. So that means going to Overtown, Miami, and looking at the opportunities that his mother had what it meant for her to work three jobs and you know travel all over that city to make sure she could take care of her son. But what that meant for him when she was working, right? What that meant for him when he didn't have his father around and he was in school and got into an altercation, right? An altercation that if he was not a black boy would have sent him to the principal's office, but instead he was arrested. So what does it mean to be arrested before you're 13 years old and put into the criminal justice system as a youth and what kind of um, path are we setting up for this young person? So for me, I go back and look at the story from as early as possible to illustrate all of the things that went wrong in this person's life, all of the things that could have gone right if we had something in place, if we didn't have structural racism and structural inequality embedded in our systems. And that is something I just lay out in the narrative. You know, after you tell the story, you tell how. So when we look at why he was arrested, we're looking at the school to prison pipeline. We're looking at how, you know, these zero tolerance policies are funneling young people, particularly in this case, black and brown students into a system that will forever change their lives. So that's just an example of something we look at um, in, in Miami. And even then we're looking at his daughter. What does that mean for his daughter that was uh, in utero when he went in, right? And now she's 11. What has her life been like? What has his mother's life been like, right? What has the mother of his child's life been like? How much has that cost them? What has, what, you know, what kind of trauma has that caused? So I look at all that stuff while telling you really um, powerful stories. And then we um, look at something a bit different in um, Jackson, Mississippi, where a man has, is facing his 40th year in prison. What does it mean to um, be married to an uh, amazing woman for 40 years and have three children and be able to expand your family um, by one child through, you know, extended visitation? So that's something that um, I get into in the book. So we're really just looking at the financial exploitation of these families. We're looking at the racial disparities of the entire system. Um, and in Kentucky, I was particularly interested in what is, what's happening for, for families, what's happening for women. Um, and some of the, the stats that led me to Kentucky is that Kentucky has the second highest female imprisonment rate in the country, right? Kentucky's rated number one and that means the worst in the nation on the rate of victims of abuse and neglect. So child maltreatment, how is it that Kentucky is first? What's happening? What needs to happen? What kind of support do these um, systems need to have in place for parents? What is going on? Are there a number of mislabelings taking place? Is this, you know, um, the criminalization of poverty, criminalization of addiction that's leading to this high level of child maltreatment? Like what's going on? Um, and then we, ha we also have uh, the highest rate of children living with uh, relatives in Kentucky in 2018. So this means that, you know, um, 
children aren't staying in homes with their parents, right? We have uh, the third highest rate in the nation of kids who have had um, parental incarceration. So for me, I wanted to come to Kentucky and say, well, I want to hear the story from uh, Kentuckians. I want to hear what they have to say about this system, about the injustice in this system. I want to hear what they have to say about recovery, about what it means to be a returning citizen, what it means to have a drug conviction once you are released, how that impacts family, right? So if you're a mother and you have this drug conviction for, you know, having been being arrested with two uh, opioid pills, right? Pills that you may have um, gotten addicted to because you had uh, been beaten by your boyfriend or you had scoliosis. The number of reasons that these women, um, you know, found, found themselves in this predicament, but we have not thought as a nation what that means and what that is doing um, to, to their family dynamic and what we can, can do to help them. So I really just wanted to to look at how the criminalization of uh, substance abuse is an assault on women and mothers um, and families. And I think that the women in uh, Kentucky just were able to, to show that so uh, poignantly, right? And one of the things that is just crucial to think about is the intersection, right? Like what's happening at the intersection of some of these systems, right? And the problem, um, for incarcerated parents specifically um, that have children that are caught in the foster care system is that these two systems aren't communicating with each other, right? They're both run by the state, but they have completely distinct missions and they rarely communicate well with each other, right? So if we have the criminal justice policymakers that are, you know, supposedly focused on uh, sentencing and punishment, and then we have child welfare that is also supposedly focused on safety and permanence for these children, um, but there's a total, like, you know, lack of meaningful communication between these systems, then we get into trouble, right? So if you um, are arrested and then you're released, and upon release, or well, let me back up, if you're arrested, and when you're arrested, your children are taken into um, the Department of Human Services um, custody, then when you get out, you want to figure out, how do I go get my children? Right? And sometimes you are handed an extensive case plan of things that you need to do. You need to take this drug and treatment um, program. You need to have a car. You need to you know, commit to a visit to your child for one hour, but you have to drive a two hour commute each way to get there. So there are things that are just unreasonable, but on top of it being unreasonable, you are up against the timeline. Right, so we have the Adoption and Safe Families Act that says that if you have a child in foster care for 15 of the most recent 22 months, then the state has to file for a termination of parental rights. And in some states, that's even shorter, a shorter time period of 12 months. So what does that mean for a mother in Kentucky that once she comes home, she has to follow this case plan? You know, and what happens if she does follow the case plan and it's still not enough, it's not good enough? They want her to uh, go to meetings, but the meetings are, are, you know, not within walking distance to where she is staying in her program and she can't leave. Like there's just a number of issues that are taking place and no one, um, well, I won't say no one, but the work is not being done to bridge the gap between these two systems to make it easier for women or mothers and parents in general to successfully gain, um, you know, to be reunited with their children. Um, and I think that that is also, you know, heartbreakingly and beautifully portrayed in the shadow system. And we have um, two really, really strong women on the panel today that are gonna tell you about their stories. They're gonna tell you about where they've been, about where they are, about what they need to make sure they can thrive. So I am glad that you guys came. I am happy to uh, have shared what is inside my book and why I decided uh, to come to Kentucky, why I thought it was relevant for the entire country to know what's happening in Kentucky. It's not enough for us to sit in the city or the state that we live in, especially if it's a, a progressive state and not pay attention to what's happening in the rest of 
the country. We have to be allies to every state that needs us, to every family that needs us. And that's why I chose uh, to report on Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. See, I told y'all, I told y'all. <laughs> She's amazing. So, and Sylvia um, touched on it a little bit, but we do have um, two women with us here tonight that were featured in the book. And um, we thought it was important um, to kick it off with just a few words um, about one of the, the women featured. So unfortunately, prior to my work um, at the ACLU of Kentucky, like I mentioned, I am formerly incarcerated. I also worked um, in the mental health field and worked with women that were, were returning from incarceration and my own personal struggles and stories um, around um, systems and what it means to be a woman and a mother that's formerly incarcerated. So in this time, I watch so many women lose custody of their children um, and lose hope and just see how these systems literally um, just, I mean, gobble up these families um, and how hard it is once you get caught in that maze to actually find your way out. So Chrissy so graciously has um, stepped up um, in this space tonight. Um, Chrissy, unfortunately and sadly enough, is one of those women who have been formerly incarcerated here in the state of Kentucky that has actually um, lost custody of her children. Um, and so we wanted to kick it off with just a little question just to hear from Chrissy a little bit. And then we're gonna come back to Chrissy um, for more in-depth, detailed um, recollection of Chrissy's story um, and why she's here tonight. So Chrissy, I think that it's, it's important um, when we talk about your story and how, uh, how, how courageous for one thing that you are and putting yourself out there, wanting to help other folks. And, but that when you started with your battles with losing your children, um, that the charge that you received was a failure to appear for a court hearing um, for child support. And it set into motion, um, you know, family separation, you being separated from your kids and, and probably every parent's um, one of their worst nightmares. Um, so I wanted, while you were going through this, um, you know, tell me about that time in your life and what was the most surprising um, part about these systems working together, this, the child welfare system and the criminal justice system? What surprised you the most during that time? Well, I mean, at that time in my life, like I owned my own home. I worked at a college. I had a brand new car. My kid went to one of the best schools. Um, but when I got pulled over and arrested that night for not going to court, um, what surprised me the most was it was the Friday before Mother's Day. And um, the day after Mother's Day, I got served with papers that said they were taking my children, which I called from booking and ensured that my children went to my brothers where I thought they were safe and had always been safe. Um, they didn't tell me anything. The affidavit was this short. Um, they didn't tell me where my kids were, who they were with. Um, they never brought them to visit me. A guardian at Lightham never came to talk to me, which is supposed to work for me and my children. And, um, you know, my children, like you said, um, uh, at the time they were three, my son, his Ravez was three and, um, Decatur was eight. And now my son will be five in three days and my daughter is 12. And, um, like you said before, like it has torn my family, like it shattered my family into a million pieces that can never be put back together. All for a sentence that started off as, Three days they served me, they took my kids. I got out 18 days later and still had that house, that job, that, that car. 
and I, I worked the case plan and nothing that I did ever worked. So what surprised me was that, that they had already made up their mind in the beginning. Thank you so much, Chrissy. And it's um, women like you that the reason that we're all here tonight and Latanya and so many other great women on this call. And we are going to come back to Chrissy. And again, I just want to acknowledge her courage and what an amazing advocate she's being tonight and how she wants to work to fi fix this system um, for all women in Kentucky. So I wanted to um, kick it off to uh, Representative Scott. And um, I'm so excited about Representative Scott. Um, so first off, Representative, tell us why this conversation is important to you. Um, definitely. So um, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be part of the conversation tonight. And I did want to share why it's important to me personally. Um, for years, I was hesitant to share what we're now calling adverse childhood experiences. I was hesitant to share mine because I didn't want to be judged because my father had um, been incarcerated because he'd been in jail so much that his nickname was a play on jailbird. Um, I didn't want to share that my mother was um, addicted to alcohol and drugs and that's um, how she died when she was only 33 and I was 16 and my brother was 12. Um, but then I, I realized one day I was speaking to some girls at the Parkland Girls and, uh, Boys and Girls Club in my neighborhood. And in conversation with them, I realized they needed to hear my story. They needed to hear me share um, the experience that my brother and I had in foster care. They needed to hear me um, share growing up in Beach Terrace um, projects here in Louisville, which um, has the highest rate of incarceration of just about any uh, area in the United States. They needed to hear me um, share what it meant to grow up um, in multiple households, to have lived with my granny, my aunt, my great aunt and uncle, um, because those were their stories as well. And I was doing them a disservice by um, not sharing my story and, and helping them to, to be able to be their full and whole selves. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the conversation just so that I can um, continue to lift up that we all have different stories to share, and sometimes those stories are less about and for you and more about and for other people um, and their ability to thrive. Thank you, Representative Scott. So for folks that don't know, Representative Scott is a force in Frankfurt and works on this issue diligently. She works with and meets with formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, so Scott, what do you think um, from a policy position, and we'll come back and hit on it more, but what do you think are some of the things that really need to change here in Kentucky? What should we really be thinking about and focusing on? Thanks, Amanda. I, I um, had some notes that I wanted to make sure um, that I shared in a clear way, so I, I wrote them down. So I really do believe that we need to create what I learned from the Black Panther Party is an um, outside, um, inside outside organizing strategy. So this means being strategic about electing people who have lived experiences with being incarcerated or being children of incarcerated parents. And we also need um, people who are building up the base of advocates who are ready to take action, who are sharing their stories, um, showing up online and in person at local and state government meetings as we are able to do so safely. Um, to make phone calls, send emails, post and tag elected officials on uh, social media. And I also believe that our Commonwealth um, has so much more to do to support our community. So restorative justice practices. I truly believe we need to have more restorative justice practices across our communities and across our schools. Um, we can certainly mandate more racial bias training that is ongoing and not just one and done. Um, we can certainly allow people in Kentucky to change our constitution to automatically restore voting rights. Um, we can definitely and we should end cash bail. I'm grateful for the bail project, but I'm also sure that its employees would love to be doing something else. 
Um, so let's get them out of a job. Uh, my colleague, Representative Lisa Wilner, has filed a bill to remove the question about a felony conviction from college applications. We should definitely support her bill during the next legislative session. Um, during my first session, I asked for a racial impact statement on the so-called gang bill that some of y'all might remember. We should definitely mandate a racial impact statement for all legislation. Um, we can answer the demands to defund the police and instead fund affordable housing, public education, public transportation, and mental health services, for example. So I believe that we can get all of this done. We have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and put in the work that you, Amanda, and your um, advocates have been putting in at the local and state level. It's gonna take all of us in order to create the kind of change that we want. Thank you, Representative Scott. And I have a couple more minutes with you, so I'm not gonna let you go yet, because it's so awesome to get to interview you right now. I feel like Katie Couric, I don't know, somebody. Um, but um, so- I'm in the hall. Yeah, there we go. Um, so Representative Scott, I think that just because you brought it up, and it, and it is so important with Kentucky and how we talked about, I'm going off script here, but how we talked about, you know, um, our systems and um, what a huge play, a part they play and we're number one for child abuse and neglect. And, you know, our education system is so underfunded. You brought up um, defunding the police and you got mm -hmm. into that a little bit, but what, what would that, that divestment investment look like? Could you hit on that just a little bit more? Definitely, so at the local level, um, our police department and, and all the systems that support the police department take up two thirds of our budget in the city of Louisville. That's shameful to me. I mean, that's money that could be going to um, fully funding affordable housing, for example, could be going to mental health services, um, could be going to making sure that our after school programs and out of school programs um, have the, the financial support that they need because, right, we've seen with COVID 19 what happens when those services are not available to people. Um, so I truly, and at the state level, we can definitely um, refocus our energy on um, addressing environmental justice, right? And remediation, that we can be making sure that um, we have people in position to hold these companies accountable when they pollute water um, in Martin County. So we can use the money that we use to militarize police against us, to instead use them for social and supportive services that people need to thrive every single day. Um, I believe in, in having a big vision and being bold and asking for everything that we want because we know that we're gonna um, be negotiated down to the middle. So why would we start at the middle just to be negotiated down to the bottom? Let's demand defunding the police so that along the way we can get some of what we're asking for. And so that requires us to think big um, to, to be bold, that requires us to know the history of policing. Why would I support an institution that was built out of keeping my people enslaved? That makes absolutely no system, no sense. Why do we continue to fund a system that attacked um, my great uncles and great aunts and grandparents with dogs when they were fighting for their rights? Why do so many of us in this country believe that we have to have um, police, that we have to have this system of law enforcement that really um, is enforcing laws that in some respects we, we don't uh, need, that we don't need to keep incarcerating people because of minor drug offenses. Um, we don't need to keep incarcerating people because they're living in poverty. So let's envision something else. Let's envision something different. Let's envision how um, we can take care of our own communities, um, how we can uh, make sure that we are all healthy and safe in our neighborhoods when we have what we need to thrive. Thank you so much, Representative Scott, and I'm glad that I went off script, that it actually goes with our conversation, because none of those things can be divorced. Um, like you said, uh, the way that um, the history of policing and where it comes from and just the lack of investment in social services and programming. And y'all, um, after this, I'm going to send Representative Scott an email, and we're going to start doing podcasts with my accent and questioning and just her really good answers. So y'all stay updated. That's our announcement. Um, but is there anything you want to add before we move on, Rep Scott? 
just um, I, I'm just so uh, appreciative of the stories that are, are being shared um, this evening. I believe that's part of the way forward is, is getting stories out there because you know sometimes people need to, to hear those stories to really understand the movement work that's happening. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for all of the advocacy from um, all of the different groups and organizations that are represented on this call today, whether you're a participant or you're, you're someone who's tuning in. Thank you for everything that you're doing to move Kentucky forward. And um, I'm going to have to hop off the call and head over to one with my former organization that paid the bills, Jobs with Justice. Um, so we're, we're continuing this conversation because what we're talking about right now is also a worker justice issue. And we have to look at mass incarceration as a worker justice issue as well. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Representative Scott. And I think that's a perfect segue into um, our next uh, amazing participant. Um, so we wanna go to Miss Latanya McNeil. Um, and I think whenever, you know, Rep Scott brought up lack of funding for social programming and investments in communities, I think that it would be um, great, Latanya, if you would tell us a little bit about, about your background and mm -hmm. why are you so dedicated? And let me tell y'all, she is dedicated. Why are you so dedicated um, in ending mass incarceration? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Latanya. Um, I, my dedication um, stems from a long time of being incarcerated. Um, it's never been in Kentucky. Like I said, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. So my incarceration um, goes back to Illinois. But it's all the same. It all blends in. It's all the same. It's the same system. It's the same um, defects. It's the same situations and circumstances um, that kept surrounding me with bars. They kept surrounding me with judges um, that kept me in the grips of the system. Um, I, I'm a person in long-term recovery, so that means I have an extensive drug history and alcohol history. Um, and that kept me in bondage, and that kept me in and out of those places and situations, and, um, and I was unable to be a mother to my child, and like, um, we are all talking about here about losing the ability to be a mother and um, having that taken away. And I was fortunate enough to have a mom that stepped in a gap and, and, and raised my daughter for me because at the time I could not raise her myself because of my addiction, because of my incarceration. Um, I was never given an opportunity basically for like treatment or, you know, every time I would go before the judge with minor cases, I would always end up in jail. And the, the, the petty jail time started turning to county jail time. The county jail time started turning to penitentiary time. And it was a vicious cycle that went on for 10 years in installments. Um, and all the while I was in jail, I was taken away from my family. While my mother had the, the burden, well, not really the burden because she loved my daughter, but while she had my daughter her household was suffering because she had another mouth to feed and she was already a single mother of four other siblings that I had up under me. So while she was at work, my daughter was being raised by my younger sister and my younger brothers. And, you know, it, it, it's just, it is something right now that my daughter right now is it's seeing therapy for, you know? So like it's, it's impacted not only my life, it's impacted my daughter's life as well. And I'm so passionate about it because now I came to this recovery recovery facility in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I had the opportunity to be the client first. So now I'm the supervisor over the same room where I got recovery from in the beginning of 2010. And I've been here ever since. And I've been seeing women come in here and, and be stripped of their rights be stripped of uh, once they like they were saying like Christina was saying uh, once they 
you know, jump through all the hoops. They still lose custody over their children and they come here and they comply with everything that we ask them to do here. And we have child care advocates here to help sit in court and fight for these women with their children. And, and I think like, even like, not because I just work, in this particular place, I think that we do a fairly good job of getting women on the right track to get their children back and, and giving them the information that they need to, to, to focus on their recovery and also be a productive member of society when they're, when they're done with this program. And of course, we have some barriers. And of course, there's, you know what I'm saying, always those ones that won't, but we have a lot of them that will and I'm just glad and I'm so passionate about it because I'm a person that's been impacted by it I'm a person that really really uh takes my job to heart you know and I and I'm glad to be in the position that I am because I try to impact these women with positivity when they come before me and get them prepared for what's on the other side of recovery and also you know what I'm saying tell them what happens when you go back and become a mother again Thank you, LaTanya. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's important, um, especially, um, you know, I'm in recovery as well, and I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, and I, after my prison time, um, got to, um, got recovery resources. And as LaTanya, someone near and dear to me that I love with all my heart and her story, saying as a black woman i didn't get those resources i think there's no way that we can leave that out of the conversation and when we talk about mass incarceration and we talk about women incarcerated how we make sure that the women in kentucky really get those supports that they need um so can you tell me latonya how do you think the way that we treated substance use disorder say 10 years ago or even the way we still we still treat um black folks that are in the criminal justice system how could how is that different um than what you've seen <laughs> oh yeah well i can start all the way back in the 80s when it, when drugs first hit the community where it was just the black and brown people um people were basically getting outcast they were outcast they were basically you know uh delinquents um nobody cared the only solution was to lock people up you know people's mother was mothers was being taken from the homes because of the drugs and you know it was never like this outcry of injustice back then when it was the crack cocaine epidemic in in the in the neighborhoods where it was the minorities and uh, like like i said when in two in the early 2000s the epidemic that happened in Kentucky uh, about four or five years ago, happened where I came from in Chicago, where people uh, was dying of heroin when the fentanyl came into the uh, communities. Um, and in my neighborhood in the projects on the low end of Chicago, um, a lot of people that looked like me was dying from the fentanyl epidemic and the bad heroin. And then the only time that something got done about it and the police stepped in and the city started taking a look at it is when um, the, the Caucasian community was coming over into our community buying a heroin and ended up dead like blocks um, outside of those projects. And, 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 and that right there triggered them to finally start paying attention and doing something about it which the end result was to go kick in all the doors in the projects and take everybody that was selling the stuff to jail. You know, so it, it really was just putting a Band-Aid on stuff because the next dope dealer stepped up and was doing the same thing. But in Kentucky, I, I sit here, a person that, that's, you know, that's not on the hair run anymore, that's now working in the field. And now to seeing the girls when I came into recovery here, uh, like a few years ago, began to, to die. You know, constantly we was putting people up on our memorial wall that had just left here and it had got some of this bad dope and they treated it like a state of emergency. You know, um, there was heroin walks, there was needle exchanges, it was like safe places to shoot up. Everybody was like giving everybody all these tools to use if you want to safely continue to use drugs. It was all these resources. 
Um, like where I work at, it's probably like very few barriers that will keep you from coming into our facility. You know, so we, we have this open door policy. Basically, we help anybody and it's at no cost to the clients that come here. And so we have all these resources here in Kentucky and, uh, and a lot of people are able to assess um, the SAP program through jail. But a lot of people that come from the jails are people not of color. And, 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 you know, and at first I paid attention with that and then I didn't pay attention and, you know, but now all with everything that's happened, it all makes sense. So, um, that's a lot of things that I've been, you know, been seeing working in this field, you know, like there's a lot of opportunities, but like people of, uh, of color, the black and brown people really are not getting these opportunities, you know, for this recovery as, as quickly as um, the white people. Thank you, Latanya. And like mm -hmm. I said, that's uh, so important. And anytime, I don't know if there's any mental health or recovery people on here, um, but it's just so important when we look at mental health um, issues and resources uh, to look with a racial equity lens. Because like I said, me and Latanya back in the day uh, worked together. We gave CPR to people together. We Narcan people together. And uh, we have to make sure that more people, more people of color, more black people specifically are getting these resources, are getting um, the help that we need. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Tanya. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, uh, before we move to Chrissy, I just wanted to um, know from you, Latanya, what would you want folks to hear from you um, on this call? How would you want them to support um, the work that you're doing or help to end mass incarceration? Like what would just be your closing words? I just want everybody to just uh, sometimes put yourself in the shoes of other people sometimes. Um, sometimes be open-minded. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of change and a lot of people, like even with all this going on, which the world would just stop and that's their solution. Everybody just stop, everybody just go home, sit down, be still, you know, don't do this, stop protesting and the world will be okay. And it's not, stop thinking everything will be okay if we, if we just go and be quiet and sit down. I think everybody needs a voice. Everybody needs to, you know what I'm saying? Listen to what their neighbors are saying. Everybody needs to like um, Attica was saying and somebody said earlier, start calling up some people, the policymakers, start complaining, start trying to change bills or be on board with people that are out here doing the work, trying to change the bills, trying to get policies and and, and start joining um, organizations. Like we have, we're great. Y'all can get with Amanda after this is over or email her or something. We have a smart justice advocates group and we're trying to get people involved and trying to be heard and doing some work that's the surrounding everything that we're talking about today. So I just, just, uh, just think everybody should just listen Stop thinking everything would just go away like the pandemic, like it's Corona or something, because it's not, you know, and just and just get involved and see what it is that you can do uh, to make this a better place and a better time for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Latanya. Mm -hmm. We'll be having, um, and I'll send along to Judy, but Latanya and some other advocates are going to be having a town hall next Monday to talk about smart justice advocates and it's a group of formerly incarcerated folks that work on policy and have changed a couple laws and keep trying to do that. Um, and Judy's our partner with that and comes to our meeting. So we work in cahoots, but anyway, um, so thank you so much, Latanya. And we wanted to get back to Chrissy. Um, like I said earlier, we wanted to just uh, start with Chrissy, but now, it's more that we have more of a background, more of a, a wider view. Um, mm -hmm. Since Chrissy does have such a personal experience with incarceration, losing custody of her children here in Kentucky, um, we wanted to go back to her. So Chrissy, um, could you tell us a little bit 
um, about how you ended up in the carceral system? Well, I mean, it began with the petty stuff, like the failure to appear that I went to jail on when my kids were taken. And when I got out and I thought that they would give them back because I didn't do anything and they didn't, then my addiction spiraled out of control, which caused in turn me to um, accumulate some more charges, um, which caused me five more years, um, which I ended up going to jail for a couple months, but they let me out. But then I absconded because that's what we do when we're in our addiction. And, um, you know, l let me back up for one second. In 2008, I met my son's father. My daughter was two months old. And um, I was already on drugs then, using cocaine. And um, he was the drug dealer. And I didn't know he was abusive as f at first. So, for about seven to 10 years, I put up with all that domestic violence, right? And so I try to use alcohol and, and drugs and all that to cover it up. And I caught charges between there, but they were little charges. But once they take, took my children and they didn't give them back and I had nothing to do with it, all it said was I was in jail for fear to appear on the affidavit. Um, I lost it within six months. I was locked up with uh, three new charges of um, uh, complicity or conspiracy to promote contraband, conspiracy to um, trafficking one, conspiracy to trafficking two, because I was sending drugs into jail to someone. Um, so in, in turn, you know, like they let me out after a couple months. I was doing good, I was sober. My son's father called, and it was back to that same vicious cycle of drugs and of, of abuse, and I decided to turn myself in because they were still allowing me to see my son every week at DCBS, even though they knew I had a warrant, and um, I thought that I was going to be arrested every time I went there, but I wasn't. But on March 4th, um, you know, they wouldn't let me see Decada at all. Her therapist said I had to turn myself in. So that's what I did. I saw my son and I talked to my social worker and said, I'm going to turn myself in. So Department of Corrections said I have to do nine months before pro border let me out. And um, then I got to go to this really, really good place that, um, and pardon me if there's some tears, like, and these aren't tears of like, missing my children like I miss my children but these are tears of kind of a joy like this was like a turning point in my life um when they put me on that greyhound and they said they were sending me back to Louisville because I lived here for like a while a long time before I moved back to Bowling Green and uh I told him it wasn't a good idea because my son's father was here and and he was three blocks away and I could hide anywhere or get anything that I wanted. And they told me I didn't really have a choice. And uh, they watched that bus pull off. And I, I got to Louisville. And Miss Taisha came and got me. And um, she took me to this wonderful place. That's the last house on the block. And uh, they taught me how to live. Like, they taught me how to make my bed every morning. I know that sounds simple to some people. But they taught me how to live, to make my bed, to shine chrome, to do these things. And, and it was all, I thought it was all such petty stuff. But now, this is the first thing I do when I get up in, my, in the morning is make my bed, right? And, um, you know, I fought for my kids while I was there. Um, I was given the opportunity to be able to go um, do therapy with my job, with the old director there. And the therapist said you should have established visitation when you had the chance. And then I remember one day, um, they were still letting me see my son. Um, every Tuesday I'd have to, you know, leave at seven in the morning and I wouldn't get back to about three for one hour visit. Um, I couldn't tell him I was his mommy. Um, they wouldn't allow me to do that. Um, cause I hadn't seen him for a year and a half, but he never asked. So I think he knew. Um, 
and on those rides, like, you know, these are people that never even knew me. Um, I'm in this program called, well, I can't, I don't know if I should mention the name. I'm in this program that um, helps women get housing, Section 8 vouchers to get their children back that are fighting for through the system. And um, this lady put together um, a series of hope dealers, as we call them, <laughs> instead of dope dealers. And, um, and I fought hard. I fought hard for my kids. And every month that social worker that just got out of college, she would come and see me. And she would change something on there every month, but every month or every six months, I mean, but she came and see me every month, but every six months she changed something on there. But every time she changed something, I already had a whole sheet of everything else that I'd already done. Plus that, you know, plus what was already on her other prior case plan, you know? And, um, basically like when we went to, um, ask about visitation for my son, the guardian ad litem and my lawyer basically almost threw punches in the courtroom because they were already talking about termination. And this was a year prior to them terminating my rights. And I, they didn't terminate my rights. I signed my rights over because the people that have my children promised me certain things. I sat down and I mediated with them and I asked them, okay, can I still send, you know, my daughter mail? Like I pay for the mailbox, you know, and I send her a letter every week and, um, I send drive as cards when it's holidays or his birthday, but I send her a card every single week. And, um, I, I asked if they would send me pictures, you know, and let me know how they're doing and let me see them um, a few times a year. And they promised all those things, but they haven't did, but a few of those things. Periodically, I might get a picture. Um, I don't know if they still give my daughter her letters because they used to give them to her and give them to her therapist. But, but one day I was coming back from one of those visits and, um, I'm in a car with the head of U of L nursing and I called, I mean, Decatur's therapist and, um, I don't know what I called her for, but I called her and she was like, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but cause I'm white too, but in her white people voice, she was like, well, if I had it my way, you wouldn't be seeing either one of your kids. And I wish you would just ride off into the sunset and let your kids be adopted. Even though I was doing everything that they said. And when it came to that point to where I was able to go and do therapy with my daughter and I called her and I had gotten permission from my director, she told me I should have established visitation when I had the chance. Well, how can I have the chance? You told me to turn myself in on the warrant to be able to see her. And then Department of Corrections said, I have to go to this long-term treatment. And so when I get to a certain point in that treatment, I'm able to have that chance. And you're telling me it's too late. So like, I signed my kids over. Um, I said goodbye to my son. My last visit was April 16th of last year. And then in April 18th, I signed over my children. And then in May, I hadn't seen my daughter in two years. And like, I know you're supposed to not have a favorite. But, like, she had a different mom with me because she was with me the longest and um, went through the most of it with me. You know, she was the one standing over me crying, thinking I was dead after he would beat me. And um, so she's had to go through a lot, a lot of therapy, and um, she's came a long way. She's came a, whole, a long way. But um, whenever I got to see her, um, I hadn't seen her in two years, and she's they put me in a room and they talked to Decatur first and she came and I knew she was, the lady was standing here and I knew she was on the other side of the wall and she was like hesitant. And I think she was like scared that I was going to be mad because the reason they technically took my children is because, um, while at my brother's house, his girlfriend and her mother, stepmother and father my brother was at work they were whipping my daughter and calling her the n-word and they weren't attending to my son 
And my daughter was sad in class and they said, what's wrong? And she said, my mommy's in jail and they took her to the counselor and, um, and she told them and, and I guess they got the other part out of her too. And that's why they removed them from my brother. You know what I mean? But only thing on the affidavit that said about me was that I was in jail for a very two period. Not that I did. They did charge me with neglect because I put them in his care. But, um, when I got to see her, I just said uh, she was standing outside the door and she wouldn't come in. I think she thought I was going to be mad at her, you know, because whenever I used to, um, this is something that happens a lot too here that everybody needs to be aware of. Um, women that are being abused or in abusive relationships, they tell their children, you don't say what goes on inside this home. You don't say this, you don't say that, you know what I mean? And, and Decatur, from the outside looking in, you would have thought it was the perfect life. Six bedroom, three bath home on five acres, brand new car in the driveway. And she had the best of clothes and was the smartest kid in class. You know what I mean? You would never have known. But because I told her not to say anything, she had to hold all that grief inside. And so, like, I think she was scared that I was going to be mad at her. So I just had to say bug and she came around the corner like running and she was as big as me. You seen the picture. She was as big as me. Like, you know, she's 12 and she's five, four and wears a nine and a half and she, you know, and Ravez is, is, is about to be five and three days and he's the size of a second grader. And like, I know that these people take good care of them. But I just wish I would have um, kept up to their work. You know what I mean? Because if not, I would have completely went on and fought to the TPR until the end. So, like, I need to get with you because I think there needs to be a Decatur and Ravez bill. And what I mean by that, meaning the amount of time that they're giving these people to get their kids back. And they're, they're, there's nothing that I could have done in jail for that case plan. There's nothing that I could have done, you know? Yeah, so Chrissy, I wanted to go back because there, um, there's a lot in your story. Like I said earlier in my story, oh, wow. uh, women that are incarcerated, three out of four women that are incarcerated has suffered severe physical and or sexual abuse. Um and for men, the, the numbers are high also. And of course, a lot of that um, abuse isn't, you know, always reported. So Chrissy, I just wanted to know with all the underlying um, years of domestic violence and abuse um, within these systems, were you ever provided counseling? Was there ever when you were incarcerated programs since there is so many women um, that go through abuse. Um, did that ever happen? The only thing that I ever got, um, okay, prior to being like incarcerated was I left and I went to a brass house, which is just like a safe spot, you know? Um, and they have classes there. Um, that was the only thing that I was ever provided, like in jail, um, no, I can't recall any, anything in jail that they ever offer me as far as trauma. Like once I got out and I got into treatment, I was offered some, some uh, therapy, which I needed more therapy. And I still do therapy every, every week. And I see my psychiatrist and, um, and I, I try to deal with it days. Some days are better than others, you know, but, but I know that there's, there's a bigger picture than what I'm seeing. And I'm a survivor. I'm 28 months sober. That might not sound like a lot to some people. That's a lot for me. And uh, my kids, when they do come find me, and they will, Decade is 12, and she has canvas pictures like these ones on my wall in her room from Disney World. Um, and she shows them to her brother, so they'll be looking for me. And when they come looking, I know they're going to have hard questions and they're going to be tough to answer, but they're not going to find me high or drunk. 
and they're damn sure not going to find a tombstone. I'm sorry for saying that word, but they're not going to find a tombstone, you know, like I refuse. So like, I just want to make a difference in, in how long they give these women and men, um, to get their children back. Like they decided from day one, they weren't giving my kids back. That's, that's how they talk in court. The guardian light them looked at me with disgust every time I came in and never said anything to me. And it wasn't like it was a horrible case. Like I beat them or I, you know what I mean? Like nothing like that. So I don't understand why he was so against me, but that's kind of my story. There's a whole lot to it. You know, I guess if you read the book, you'll hear a little bit more, you know? Yeah. But, um, and Chrissy, her story is uh, so beautifully written in the book. And, um, like I said, I mean, the fearlessness that is Chrissy and putting her story out there and talking about the abuse and mental illness and substance use disorder, I really, um, really highly recommend to read the book. And um, thank you, Chrissy. Just before we get to questions, though, um, just really briefly, is there anything that you would want to tell people that is on this call today. Maybe today's the first day that they're really, um, which I don't think this to be true of anybody on this call, but maybe it's the first day they're really learning about mass incarceration. Or maybe this is the first day they have come to realize what an issue it is for women, for families here in the state of Kentucky and heard some of our alarming stats and about how, inter how abuse, how racism, how poverty, um, how mental illness, how all of these are interwoven. What would you want to tell folks on this call and um, what you would want them to know about women that are incarcerated or have been formerly incarcerated here in Kentucky? I just want you guys to know that like just because we committed a crime and we have a consequence behind that you know, just like with every reaction or with every action, there's a reaction, you know, there's every choice, there's a consequence. Just because we made one bad choice, most of those choices were, were pushed upon us by an abuser most of the time. And, um, we do what they say. And, um, just because we, we committed that crime, that's not necessarily who we are. And that doesn't make us a bad mom. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be a mother again. And that's all I got. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, and again, con congratulations, Chrissy, on your recovery, on treating your mental health, um, on being an advocate, um, and to Latanya and everyone else. So I think I'll turn it over to Ms. Sylvia A. Harvey, um, to, and we'll go to questions. Hi again, everyone. Thank you, Chrissy, so much for that really, you know, powerful story. And thank you, LaTanya, um, for just, you know, just sharing and teaching. And I think that that's what it's about, right? It's about being brave enough to say, this is my story. This is what happened. This is what needs to happen. And I think we have to keep doing that, right? And I will follow Attica's lead in saying, and for me, I think it's something almost that just skips my mind sometimes that on top of being a journalist, on top of being a reporter, on top of being an author, I'm also directly impacted, right? So my father served 27 years in prison and that has, you know, been the sort of catalyst for me to look at all of these structural inequalities that are impacting families across the country. Um, and I think that it's important for us to all recognize what it means to have a system that we can literally call our criminal justice system, right? I think that we currently have a system that is only seeking justice for some, and that isn't how it should be, right? So what do we need to do to, to change that? We need to get people to think differently about those that are impacted instead of making assumptions that, oh, well, they shouldn't have committed this crime or they shouldn't have, you know, chosen to, you know, do these things when in fact, almost 95% of the time, it's about structural inequality, it's about lack of access, it's about poverty, and we need to be creating opportunities, and we need to be thinking about 
you know, why um, black, brown, and poor people are considered um, disposable in this country, right? We have to think about what we believe as a country about these demographics that are allowing us to continue um, letting this happen. And I will say that we are in an amazing, important, powerful moment right now. We all see that, you know, the demonstrations have catapulted all across this not even just this nation, like all across the world um, after seeing the murder of George Floyd. And I think that as a collective, we're starting to really see the injustices that are falling on um, demographics, black, brown, and poor. And we have to keep doing that. We have to, as a, as a country, think about what it would be like if that was you, right? I think the problem is so often we assume that that's someone else's problem, that that's not something that can impact us. But if you take just one moment and you say, well, what if that was me? You know, what if that was my son or my daughter or my, you know, spouse? And think about the cumulative, like, social, emotional, and economic cost of this system. Um, and, and I think that's, that's it, right? I know that this system is broken and I know that it's gonna take all of us um, to, to make a change, to really um, create something new, something powerful, something that's gonna work for all people, um, not just the privileged. Um, and thank you guys for coming and we are excited for your questions that are gonna come. Well, if you have questions, we're here. Thank you. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Amanda, for questions, if there are any. Absolutely, if there's any questions, um, please utilize the chat or even raise your hand in your little window. <laughs> you can just chime in. Yeah. Ooh, everybody's silent. We've left them speechless. I know. <laughs> I mean, those are some powerful stories. So I could see that. Where can we purchase the book? Oh, great question. The book is obviously available where all books are sold. But locally, please support Carmichael's. Carmichael's is our um, official bookseller for the event. And I've heard that Carmichael, Carmichael's has gotten the book to people in two days. And Amazon has been taking five, five weeks. So that's pretty impressive. Um, if you're in Kentucky, it's you can you can get the book through um, Carmichael's. If you're somewhere else in the country, uh, it's everywhere books are sold. Thank you for asking. All right. So we have a question from Ben Goldman. Um, it is what kinds of policy change and or programs would best advance behavioral health equity? And I can start to chime in on that and then I'll um, look around for, I think Judy may have some ideals, LaTanya and other folks that may have ideals. Um, Representative Scott um, hit on um, some things um, when it came with, to the criminal justice system such as we have to work on sentencing reform, we have to do racial impact statements. And um, like me and LaTanya hit on earlier, when po policies, laws are changed, we have to make sure those are equitable. It is not okay for Black Kentuckians, Kentuckians of color to be left behind in anything quote unquote reform um, wise. And that's something that the ACLU, our smart justice advocates are learning so much about and working on hard. Um, there's also a bill that my colleague, uh, Jackie McGranahan, she's not on here, but has worked on um, that Representative Scott is a sponsor of, and it's a maternal mortality um, bill because black women are more likely um, to die during childbirth and within a year after having a child. And within that bill, there is more implicit bias training for medical professionals. Um, there's doula services. Um, there's a few things um, in that bill when it comes to health of um, black mothers here in the state of Kentucky, all mothers, but of course, like I said, um, black Kentuckians get left behind. So to try to um, fix some of those issues um, 
and we'll go ahead and let Judy on the local level, I think, has some great stuff. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Ben works at the Center for Health Equity, so uh, he's a great guy. Um, so we, a couple of years ago, we did a health impact assessment of children and uh, impact of incarceration on children in, uh, in, part, in impact of parental incarceration on children in Jefferson County. And one thing we found was great, there was a great racial disparity. Uh, and so uh, children, black and brown and poor children are being uh, uh, more impacted uh, by far than, uh, than middle class and white kids. But one thing we had was a, called a family responsibility statement. And if people will just ask, <laughs> Ask the question: Do you have children? Do you support the children? If they could, if the judges ask them, if the pretrial assessment asks them, if they ask them when they book them, you know, there. If we could just like uh, hardwire in the idea that when you have that person in front of you, whoever's making that decision throughout the pipeline, the criminal justice, uh, that like take children into consideration, and we can do that at the local level. You know, and if if they do, uh, if they have children, like, do they need, um, you know, do they need the resources that Chris, Chrissy was talking about? Do they need, what do they need? And uh, probation officers, they probably ask. But do you know what I'm saying? From the moment of arrest <laughs> to the to the judge here, at, we elect our district judges, and we can see how important a judge's decision could be in a no knock. It's the same with the judge sitting in somebody to jail without asking if they have children that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. Great example, Judy. Um, that family impact statement is a game changer and so important. Um, then we have a question from Erica. How did you get connected to Chrissy and other folks whose stories you tell? Oh, that's a good question, Erica. It was very hard. <laughs> As I just said, Kentucky was one of those places that you're just like trying to get in, you're trying to get in, you're trying to get in. I'm like, what's going on? Why am I being blocked, 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 blocked? Um, and I think it was this idea of being very private and also um, what I learned is having some level of stigma around incarceration and what that looks like and what that means and not wanting people in your business and the idea of it being a small town um, and not wanting to be right out there. Um, and so at first I was like, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just forget about it. Um, and I was in touch with Judy, Judy Jennings, which is on the call, which, you know, is responsible for, um, for this, um, convening, um, said, let me try to put you in touch with a few people, you know, and she put me in touch with Amanda first, right? I think Amanda, you were the first person. Amanda was like, oh yeah, I know a whole bunch of women. Let me let them know what's going on and see if they're interested. And then they'll send you, you know, emails. So at that point, I had decided um, that it made more sense to think about um, reentry, right? So because I focused on long-term incarceration and very serious crimes in other parts of the state in the book, you know, if we're looking at murder convictions and we're looking at life sentences and we're looking at 40 years, um, we I thought, oh, it would be a good idea to look at the other side of that. What happens when you do make it out? What happens? How is that impacted? Right, you can see that even um, a, a month in jail can completely change your life. So um, that was the idea. Like, all right, we're talking recovery now. We're talking reentry, and because we're talking reentry, we're talking recovery. I think that's something that comes with um, really, really great um, pride. Right, you can say, yeah, this thing happened to me, but I survived and I fought hard and I've come out on the other end. So by taking that. Um, that approach, um, I was I was able to you know connect with a lot of women. Unfortunately, some women weren't weren't able to be included. There were so many powerful stories, and I just want to acknowledge that now um, that yeah, I wasn't able to include everyone. My editor and I, I was like, what about this one? But this and that. It was it was there were just too many powerful stories. Um, but I will continue to tell those stories, and I will continue um, to put them in other kinds of publications and make sure that we're still raising. Um, awareness and also thinking about policy. One of the policies um, I don't think you guys have implemented in um, Louisville, and this is just to add to um, what they were talking about earlier, is um, the Adoption of Safe Families Act. In a lot of the states, you have it in New York and California, where there are amendments at the state level that say that if you are incarcerated, um, the child welfare, the child welfare 
um, agency has to give you um, some flexibility. They have to work with you. They have to consider um, that your incarceration is not voluntary. And I think looking at something like that at the state level will be very helpful um, for uh, parents that are, are losing the rights of their children in Kentucky. Um, but yeah, so it was through Judy who's on the call and through Amanda who's on the call and yeah. Awesome. And we have the next question is for you also. Were you, this is from Amber Duke, were you surprised about the similarities in stories, experiences you found in your research across geographies despite the differences in policy law on the local level? Hmm. Uh, similarities. Actually, no, I think that what I saw were like, you know, um, huge disparities that continue to exist, right? So if I was looking at Black men that were convicted of crime, they had longer sentences, they had, you know, um, it, it just, it was, it was, the racial uh, disparity was evident across the board. And I think that one of the things that brought me to Kentucky was looking at the shift in the number of black women to white women incarcerated. And it used to be that black women were incarcerated at six times the rate of white women. And that has shifted to two to one. So for me, it was like, well, whoa, what's happening um, in this demographic? What's happening with white women specifically? And is this uh, related to um, substance use disorder and what kind of charges are they facing, right? So even if I look at the charge and I say, well, yeah, this person received a harsh sentence of, you know, two years for two pills or three pills or something that seems so minute. It's like, this is crazy. This is such a grave injustice. But at the same time, that's why I, I went into uh, Latanya's story to say, well, listen, you know, back in the day, back when you know, we had this 100 to 1 disparity um, in drug sentencing, which is now, I believe, 1 to 20, which is still bad, but it's not as bad as it was. You know, if you if you were Black, you would get way more than two years, right? So even when that two years has destroyed um, a white man or white woman that, you know, is dealing with a substance um, use disorder, uh, we can just look back at the crack epidemic and people are still in prison, right? They are still in prison 30 years later, 40 years later for um, drug crimes that should have been really small, um, small things, should have been treated as um, a health crisis and it wasn't. So I continue to, to see disparities and even in Louisville, you know, black people were overrepresented. I mean, the only reason that wasn't the focus um, in Louisville on the book is just because you know, black, black people were at the center in the other stories. And it's true that we just are disproportionately impacted, um, but it was still for me just important to illustrate that there is some shift happening. And I think that because of that shift, more people are starting to pay attention to incarceration. It's no longer just a black or brown thing. So if we can see that, hey, even um, a white woman in America can be convicted you know, of, of a crime, of, of a bad check or something like that and just have her life change. I think that that narrative is important. Um, and, you know, the disparities are real. They don't change. And they, if you are in Mississippi, you're in Jackson, like it's bad, you know, it's bad. If you're in Miami, it's bad. There's no parole. Like it's, it's still, uh, it hasn't gotten any better. It's, it's not like I can say, oh, if you're black or white, you get the same treatment here. It's like, no, you don't. You still get the short end of the stick if you're black. But if you are poor, you also get a short stick. Not as short as being black and poor, but you can get a short stick. So. Hey, Sylvia. So we have a minute left. I think I'll turn it over to, I think I went through all the questions. I hope I haven't missed any. Sorry, y'all. Um, I'm not a seasoned moderator yet, but um, I'll turn it over to either Judy, Sylvia, if y'all have any closing words. Judy? We can hear you. Thanks for everybody that's on the panel and their courage and their honesty and all the work they're doing in their lives to make this place better for children and mothers. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Sylvia. And thanks for all the people that are participating. We didn't know if 
people would show up as our first time out. So uh, we, uh, yes, we now see the public view up here enough to spend an hour and a half with us and, and look this through. And you, we'll be working on all the suggestions and stories that we heard. And any any of the story sharers want to say anything? Chrissy or Latonya? Want to say goodbye, Chrissy? <laughs> I just wanted to make a um, correction really quick that my son was nine months old when he got took. Nine months old? But I have to jump off here. I'm so, so sorry. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, I think. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that chimed in, and I appreciate you, um, Sa for all that you do, all that you've done. I've really got a lot out of, out of your book, um, you. out of how you speak, out of our brief meeting and our conversations. And thank you, Judy, you're awesome. And Amanda, you're a great moderator. Um, and everybody that's listening, um, thank you. And please get Sylvia's book, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys, um, this is really good. And um, I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you, Latanya. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Wasn't she great? You yeah, have another career. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the accent, y'all. The accent, I'm telling you. I roped y'all in. Yeah, Latanya, you also have another career. Latanya is the next speaker. She was like, listen, I'm telling you the story. I was like, whoo! I was snapping my fingers, Latanya, but you didn't hear me because I was on mute. But I was like, I hear you. I hear you, girl. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, going on. Me and Latonya's been tag teaming for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to come back down and see you guys once all this is over. Because obviously this was supposed to be a real time event, but with the pandemic, we were able to meet in real time. But we will reconnect in real time as soon as we're able. Aw, bye, y'all. Thank you bye. so much. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming, being here. Love y'all. <laughs>